So welcome everyone to the Maryland Business Rebooted webinar. The Maryland Rebooted program was created by the Smith School of Business faculty members at the University of Maryland, Michelle Weddle and Judy Frills, with really the goal of helping Maryland business owners navigate the impact of COVID-19. And today our lecture will be given by Smith School's very own marketing professor, Jia Zhang. I'm sure you were here last time when we learned a lot, a lot from her um, from the, this overview of the retailing industry and the current trends that we're seeing that she covered in her first webinar. And today we'll continue to hear from G for the second webinar in her three part retailing series for NBR. And as you can see here, the topic for today is utilizing data and analytics to build a winning retail business. My name is Nicole Kim and I'm a coordinator for the program. In today's lecture, I'll help deliver any questions that you might have um, to G, or we prepared this in a meeting format so that you can actually turn on your videos and ask G yourself if you have any questions throughout the webinar today. So now without further ado, take it away, G. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the organizers of the Maryland Business Rebooted Program Professors Michelle Vado, Judy Frels, and the executive director of our executive education program, Chris Thompson, for their extraordinary work of putting together this webinar series, and to Nicole King for uh, moderating the webinars and um, having everything organized so well. So without further ado, let me, first of all, um, excuse me. Um, outline the agenda for today's webinar. Um, first, I'm going to spend the most chunk of the time on retail performance measures so that everybody will have a fairly solid foundation about understanding how to assess the performance of retail stores, retail companies, as well as individual merchandising departments, product categories and brands and so on and so forth. And then I'm going to illustrate how to use fair share analysis to assist uh, assortment size decisions and shelf space allocation decisions. And if time allows, I will give a brief outline about utilizing statistical models to enhance retail decisions. But before I move on to the first topic, I'd like to do a very quick poll of the audience so that we can have a better idea about our participants. So I'm going to launch a poll in a short moment. It consists of three very short questions about yourself and your response will be anonymous. We don't know who gave which answer. We're going to say it's the aggregated responses. So thank you for sharing um, your information with us. Without further ado, please take a moment to fill out the poll. So it looks like we have a nice mix of people coming from different types of business um, and also from different parts of the country, mostly Maryland, of course. Uh, don't worry if you did not attend the first uh, retail webinar. As Nicole mentioned, all the webinars have been recorded and you can view the recording online at a later time. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing the results. The first topic and the main topic of today's class is retail performance measures. Mute yourself if you forgot to do it. Thank you very much. Most of the materials under this topic is based on the textbook Retailing Management by Levy, Bartz, and uh, White, and De Gravo, the 10th edition. Um, so here's the summary of the retail performance measures that I'm going to cover in today's webinar. As you will see that some of them are general performance measures for which I'm going to focus on their applications in the retailing context, while others are specific to the retail business. And I'll spend more time elaborating on how to utilize them to assist the retail operations and the performance. Starting with net sales. Net sales are also called total revenues. For a retail company, it is the gross sales directly from the um, scanner checkout system, plus promotional allowances, and then adjusted by customer returns 
and other possible sources of revenue. A little bit of clarification of um, promotional allowances. Promotional allowances are payments made by vendors to a retailer in exchange for the retailer to offer special promotional support to the vendor's merchandise. For example, if you walk into a supermarket and you see Coca-Cola products being displayed on end of aisle displays, and those are precious real estate opportunities, which tend to attract high traffic and high attention, and certainly can boost the sales of the product being on special display. But in this case, the retailer would not do it for free for the Coca-Cola company. Um, the company has to pay an additional payment in the form of display allowance. Um, for some retail companies, especially supermarkets, drugstores, this promotional allowance source can be um, a significant source of additional revenues. Obviously, the amount of merchandise that has been purchased but later returned by customers needs to be subtracted to arrive at the net sales figure. Like most performance measures we're going to talk about today, net sales comes with a time span. So it can be measured on an annual basis, quarterly basis, or monthly basis. So it is important for you to clarify the time span involved when talking about or citing a specific net sales figures. The next performance measure is gross margin. Gross margin is also called gross profits. For a retail company, it's the difference between the net sales and the cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is a performance measure that's unique to the retailing business. It is the value of the merchandise sold in a given time period, valued at the cost to a retailer. Let me further clarify what it means at the cost to a retailer. It means the value of the merchandise should be valued at the wholesale prices that a retailer pays to the suppliers, the vendors to acquire the merchandise, not the retail prices that a retailer charges to consumers. Gross margin or gross profits are often converted into a percentage term for comparison purposes, in which case it is computed as the dollar amount of gross margin divided by the net sales and then converted into percentage. Once again, gross margin also comes with a time span. So when you cite the gross margin figure or the percentage gross margin figure, you should clarify what time span is involved. The next performance measure is net profit. Net profit is often indicated as net income in the income statement. Okay, it can be computed either before tax or after taxes. So in the case for net profit after taxes, it's gross margin for the subtracted by expenses and the taxes. As you may have learned in the accounting course, Expenses can be further divided into operational or operating expenses and interest and other forms of payments. In general, expenses are those costs other than the cost of merchandise that are incurred in the normal courses of doing a business. Just like percentage gross margin, net profit is often converted into a percentage term for comparison purposes. So when we use the term net profit margin by common understanding, it is a percentage um, term. So it is computed as the dollar amount of net profit divided by net sales and converted into a percentage term. So, so far, those are common performance measures. And if you want a further illustration, I would refer you to a um, financial accounting uh, book or refer to earlier recordings of three webinars offered by Professor Eugene Cantor of the accounting department for the marketing, uh, for the Maryland Business Rebooted Program. Um, you can contact Nicole or any of us here for further information on how to locate those recordings. In the next section, I'm going to touch upon retail performance measures that are unique to the retailing context 
or play a particularly important role in assessing a retail company's overall performance or profitability. Starting from same store sales, I'm sure many of you have heard about same store sales because this is the most commonly cited performance measure of retail companies in the popular press and the business media. Um, it is measured as the average annual or monthly or quarterly net sales for stores of a retailer that have been opened for at least a year. And it is often also called the comparable store sales, comp store sales, or simply abbreviated as COMPS, C-O-M-P-S. So if you were to work in the retail company, you may hear your manager saying, oh, COMPS were good last quarter, or COMPS went down last, um, uh, last year. And you know that when they talk about COMPS, it's about same store sales. So same store sales are computed based on stores that have opened for at least a year and the rationale is that newly opened stores tend to have systematically higher or lower sales than existing stores. So it's better to wait until the dust settles, sort of speak. So that's why by convention, um, uh, the store level sales uh, measures are reflected by same store sales. But I do want to caution everybody that uh, same store sales numbers are not adjusted for inflation. So we should expect an annual increase of about two to 3% uh, under normal economic conditions. So that's why by rule of thumb, if a retailer same store sales has gone up by 3% or more, it is considered satisfactory or good. If it falls below 3%, it is often being cited as a disappointing performance. But I hope after today's webinar, um, you'll take away with a better understanding that there are many more insightful performance measures than same store sales, okay? Um, the reason same store sales might be the most cited performance measures in the media is because of its easy availability. Many retail corporations regularly release their same store sales figures to the public and that might explain its common usage. But once again, as you will see, it really is not the most insightful measures. The next performance measure is something I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on because I want to make sure that everybody gets the main takeaways here. That is return on assets. So I'd like to just by a quick show of a hand on the screen um, how many of you have heard about return on assets? Maybe from accounting class, maybe from the media. Just by a show of a hand, how many of you have heard about return on assets? All right, don't worry. I will talk about uh, it uh, from the definitional equation. Um, thank you, Stephen. Actually, if Stephen, if you don't mind um, uh, sharing with us, so in what context or where have you learned or heard about return on assets? Okay, that's all right. Um, so I'm going to start from the very basic definitional equation of return on assets. So return on assets is the ratio of net profit divided by a company's total assets. So it is used to measure the overall profitability of a company in general. And here we're focusing on its application in the retailing context. Okay, once again, return on assets is a performance measure that applies to all kinds of companies. But as you will see in a few moments, it plays a particularly important role in assessing the overall profitability of a retail company. So it's computed as the net profit of a company divided by the total assets. And as you may uh, learn from accounting class, you can find the net profit, in other words, net uh, income information from a company's income statement. And you can find the total assets from the balance sheets, okay? Um, 
in case you have never heard about uh, total assets, don't worry. Um, in a nutshell, total assets, um, it's the owner's equity plus liability. What it means is it's a retail company's own resources plus the resources that it has borrowed from other sources that it puts together to run its business, okay? Um, and return on assets is usually computed on an annual basis. In other words, we're using net profit of a retail company in a year in the numerator. And the total assets is a snapshot measure. It's uh, supposed to reflect the asset holding situation of a company by the end of its physical year as it is reported in its balance sheet. Okay, so return on assets is usually expressed as a percentage term. Most retail companies have their return on assets in the range of five to 10%. And so how do we interpret a 5% return on assets? So you can interpret it as for every dollar of total assets available to a retailer to run its business, it makes $0.05, in other words, five cents of net profit in a year, okay? So as you can see that return on assets is the input and the output measure. The input is in terms of the total assets available to a retail company. And the output is in terms of the net profit, in other words, net income in a year. Um, by the way, if you have any questions about any of the content, um, please feel free to ask questions and Nicole will facilitate your questions. And in fact, today we deliberately choose to use the regular Zoom meeting format so that you could also just unmute yourself and go ahead to ask questions. Well, return on assets can be further decomposed into two parts as shown by the equations on the screen here. So from the definitional equation, we can decompose it into two parts. By the way, I hope you're able to see how my um, mouse moves on the screen, okay? Um, so the second equation on the screen, um, the first part is a ratio of net profit divided by net sales. What is this? You may recall that just a few slides ago, this is how net profit margin is computed, right? And the second component is the ratio of the net sales um, in a year divided by a retailer's total assets. And this ratio is called asset turnover. What it reflects is for every dollar in total assets available to a retailer to run its business, what is the net sales the retailer is able to generate in a year. And as you can see, this decomposed equation very well illustrates that return on assets combines two critical aspects of a retail business. That is the so-called margin management and asset management. The margin management is captured by the net profit margin. In other words, out of a given transaction, by the end of the day, what is the net profit margin? But this is not um, what contributes to the overall profitability. There's another just as important aspect, the so-called asset management part. That is how efficient is a retailer utilizing its total assets, in other words, total resources available in generating sales. And so a key takeaway from today's session is return on assets, it's a more comprehensive measure of the overall profitability of a retailer than the net profit margin. And fundamentally, so that's why return on assets plays a particularly important role in evaluating the overall performance or overall profitability of retail companies. And fundamentally, this is because the retailing business, essentially it's about buying and selling, buying and selling. So how much money a retailer makes in the year depends not only on how much money you can make out of a given transaction, but how many transactions can you make buying and selling, buying and selling in a year? The latter part of it is what asset management about and is measured by asset turnover. Okay, by the way, are there any questions at this point? All right. 
then we're going to do some exercise very soon. Gee, um, can I actually ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. So it wasn't asked by our audience, but just listening to your um, kind of explanation on return on assets, mm -hmm. I was kind of curious if, you know, as a retailer, if there's like a number that they should be aiming to hit um, for mm -hmm. their return on asset when they think about like their own business. And I'm wondering if maybe like for our audience as well, depending mm -hmm. on maybe how long they've had their business, is there a different number that they should be shooting for if they're like a new business versus like an older business? Just kind of curious about that. Okay, it's a great question. Well, there's not a particular target, but as I said, for most retail companies, return on assets is in the range of five to 10%. Um, so if you are on the lower end of it, um, it's not necessarily, um, 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 so if you are falling below 5%, that certainly um, might be a reason for caution. If you go above 10%, you should really give a pack on yourself. You're definitely on the stellar performance uh, category. Uh, so that's the normal range. And the other part of your question is also uh, a really great one. That is, does it matter by uh, how long a retail company is in place? In fact, there is wide variation even within the different retail sectors. And it's not only a matter of how uh, long the history of a company is, but it's asset holding. For example, a company uh, that is in the very aggressive expansion stage might uh, take on a much higher liability to building the infrastructure for future growth. Right. And so if you uh, keep in mind that return on assets reflects um, you know, the so-called profitability in a given um, physical year. So it's only a one year measure. It does not reflect long-term potential um, or capabilities, okay? So when we look at the return on assets measures, understand what it can reflect and what it doesn't. It certainly does not uh, reflect the future potential and you need to in fact to dig deeper into the contributing factors. So that's why this decomposed equation uh, can be quite insightful. So look at the net profit margin, compare that with other retailers selling similar type of merchandise and look at the asset turnover uh, to have some idea as to whether you're uh, using, utilizing your assets in the meaningful way, in the efficient way. Okay, again, um, there's not a single target, but for most retail companies, it's in the range of five to 10%. Mm. All right. Thank you. Jean. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Um, as we're going to see with uh, two uh, real world examples. So suppose we were going to compare the overall profitability of Walmart and Tiffany. Those are certainly two very different types of retailers selling very different types of merchandise, having very different price uh, points and positioning, market positioning, as well as target uh, markets. Right, so where do we start? Um, obviously we need to look at some measures that are comparable across retail companies or companies in general that are in very different uh, businesses. So here are uh, a consolidated version of the income statements of the two companies uh, based on their latest annual reports filing. So um, I pulled those numbers from the annual reports of both companies um, of the physical year ending in January 31st, 2020. So this is the last uh, physical year before the start of the pandemic. And I think that's a more meaningful comparison uh, in any case. Okay, so we don't have to get into much of the details, but obviously the first row, the net sales, and some companies reported as total revenues, okay? Um, so this actually incorporates, in addition to selling merchandise, other potential sources of revenues. And then the last row is the net income after tax. So based on net income after tax and the net sales, obviously we could compute the net profit margin of both companies. Okay, there you go. So for Walmart is 2.8%, for Tiffany is 12.2%. So here, the question for you is, Based on this comparison, it might be tempting, or can we draw the conclusion that Tiffany is about four times as profitable as Walmart? I'm curious to hear from the audience. 
So do you think Tiffany is about four times as profitable as Walmart? Um, you could just, uh, if you um, care to share your thoughts with us, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. I guess, by the way, I asked a question, you know, it's kind of a trick question or uh, a leading question. The answer is obviously no. Um, what else should we look at? So the net profit margin figures only reflects out of a given amount of transaction, what is the net profit in percentage terms? It does not capture how efficient is each retail company in utilizing their total resources available. In other words, utilizing their total assets in generating the base amount of transaction from which we're going to, uh, from which we compute the net profit margin figures. So in order to reflect the second aspect, that is how efficient has a retailer utilized its total assets in generating sales, we need to look at their total assets figures, right? Once again, you can find the total assets in a company's balance sheet for those publicly traded companies that are required to file uh, 10K forms uh, to SDC. Um, this is not accounting class. So I'm not going to get into the details, but you may know or recall that total assets can be broken down by current assets and fixed assets. It can also be broken down into um, a company's uh, equities plus liabilities. Both methods should lead to exactly the same value of total assets. And if you don't care about the specific breakdown, no worries, it's all the total assets are always listed at the very bottom, the last line of a balance sheet. Okay, so for Walmart, their total assets um, at the end of the physical year, uh, ending uh, January, 2020, it's about uh, 236 and, uh, uh, and a half uh, billion dollars. And for Tiffany, it's about $6.66 billion. So now combining the total assets numbers and the net sales figure, we should be able to compute the so-called asset turnover. And then applying both net profit margin and asset turnover to the decomposed formula of return on assets, now we get a better idea. Okay, so the return on assets for Walmart is 6.3%. For Tiffany, it's 8.1%. Now we can say that the overall profitability of those two very different retailers is actually fairly similar, certainly not four times apart. Okay, so once again, the key takeaway from this section of the discussion is return on assets, it's a more comprehensive measure of the overall profitability of a retail company than net profit margin, even though most of us are more used to, uh, more familiar with net profit margin figures. Um, if there are no questions on return on assets, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Okay. Um, gross margin return on inventory. I'm curious how many people, just by a show of a hand here, how many people have heard about, or come across, or even have used gross margin return on inventory? How many people have heard about this measure here? All right, if not, you came to the right place. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to introduce you uh, one of the most important and perhaps one of the most underutilized retail performance measures. Okay, gross margin return on inventory is abbreviated as GMROI and it's usually pronounced as Jim Roy. Jim Roy. Um, it is a performance measure that is meant to reflect the merchandising performance of individual merchandise departments, categories, brands, and you can also compute it for individual stock keeping units. But before I elaborate on its computations, I'd like to, uh, for us to um, you know, do a mental exercise together. So please do uh, feel free to unmute yourself and share your thoughts. 
Um, so put yourself in the shoes of a general merchandising manager of a supermarket retailer. Most supermarkets um, around the nation uh, would have uh, many merchandise departments, including the bread department and wine department. Maryland is exception because um, Maryland is one of the so-called dry states, which has pretty strict rules on retail sales of alcoholic um, products. Because of that, most supermarket retailers choose to not um, have sell alcoholic products, including wines, in their stores. But putting that aside, for most supermarkets in other parts of the country, certainly there's always a bread department and there's a wine department. Just based on your gut feelings, which department do you think it's more profitable for a typical supermarket retailer and why? Well, the why part is the most relevant part for the purposes of our discussion here. So I'd like you to think for a moment, the bread department and for, you know, um, make the discussion a little bit easier, think about commercial bread department where a retailer buys bread from suppliers and add a markup and sell to its consumers. Okay, uh, we don't have to consider the self-produced bread, but if you want to do it, um, you know, essentially it's the same idea. All right, so commercial bread department versus wine department, which one is more profitable for a typical supermarket retailer and why? Um, so, or how about this? Um, most people probably feel more comfortable uh, typing your answers and also we can simultaneously get more responses. So would you please type your answer um, in the chat room and you can share it with everybody or if it makes you com uh, more comfortable, you can also send it to me as a private chat. So is a commercial bread department more profitable or is the wine department more profitable? And if it possible, could you um, briefly mention why? And we certainly have seen different answers so far, almost a half off split. Some people uh, think it's the wine department. Some people think it's the bread department. Um, once again, this is not about what's the absolute correct answer. There's, I can tell you upfront, um, it depends on the retailer's own operations and the performance. There's no absolute correct answer, but the why part is really what's most relevant um, to my uh, motivation for the Jim Roy measure, okay? So we've seen some people say it's wine, some people say it's bread because uh, bread has uh, more turnover, but it could also be wine because margin is higher. Uh, Sharon also mentioned that in Maryland, uh, there are not a lot of markets that sell wine and bread. You're absolutely right. As I mentioned, Maryland is one of the dry states, uh, which has very strict rules on selling alcoholic products. And because of that, most supermarkets actually do not sell wine at all. Okay, but putting that aside, think about, um, you know, in supermarkets where both products and every supermarket obviously has a bread department, but um, for the supermarkets that do sell wine, what do you think? Um, whether it's more, exp uh, uh, which department is more uh, profitable? So uh, Sonia um, representing one of the camps saying it's wine because wine are more expensive with higher margins. Um, and wine is more, uh, so um, Roxanne said wine is more appealing as they advertise that they gave you pleasure and it helps you relax. And of course, that's the advertising pitch and which allows them to charge higher prices and higher margin, right? All right, great. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And uh, I think some people are also sitting back and saying that I'm not sure I can see both perspectives and you're absolutely right. So if I may summarize the different perspectives that you guys have brought to the table. Okay, um, well, wine certainly has higher margin. Let me just make sure that I'm not missing out on any additional chats here. Okay, um, 
So Sharon also just said that the bread sell in many different uh, forms. Um, so wine certainly offers higher margin, um, and partly because it's a product that gives you pleasure, uh, helps you relax and those things. Um, but the bread has much higher turnover. Okay, and also related to that, um, in terms of product penetration, arguably bread is consumed by almost everybody, uh, purchased and consumed by almost everybody except for people on, uh, with dietary restrictions. But the wine is not something that most people buy on a very frequent basis. Um, so, well, that's a perspective that could tilt the balance, right? Um, and another perspective, think about it. Well, we need to compare apple and apple and orange and orange. It, in general, uh, costs much more to stock up the wine department than the bread department in the typical supermarket, just because wine has higher unit uh, prices and it's just a more expensive product, right? So we can't just directly compare the dollar amount of profit from the two departments because that would not be fair. We need a performance measure that is comparable on equal grounds. In other words, it should be normalized or standardized for $1 uh, investment in the inventory. Um, how does each product or product category uh, perform? And uh, that leads to gross margin return on inventory, Jim Roy, okay? And as I said, Jim Roy is the most commonly used measure to reflect the merchandising performance. And as you'll see that the Jim Roy actually shares some similar spirit as return on assets, except the Jim Roy is, compute at, uh, is computed at a much more micro level. It is computed usually for individual merchandise departments, categories. You could also compute it for an individual brand of a product or even for specific stock keeping units. So to make the exposition a bit easier, I'm going to use product category as a unit, but keep in mind that it can be moved up or down in the merchandising structure um, you know, spectrum. So Jim Royd is an input and output measure. The definitional equation is the first one on the screen, okay? It is computed as the gross margin of a product category divided by the average inventory at the cost of that category, okay? Um, gross margin is also called gross profit. Remember that it comes with a span. So Jim Royd is also a performance measure that comes with a time span. And without otherwise specified by convention, it is usually computed on an annual basis. In other words, we use the gross margin of a product category in a year, okay? Um, average inventory at a cost reflects the average amount of working capital that a retailer invests in the inventory of that product category. In a few moments, I'm going to further illustrate in practice how to compute average inventory at a cost. Okay, for now, if you ignore the word average, just look at inventory at a cost. Inventory at a cost is a snapshot measure. It reflects the state of fare at a particular point of time. So for example, on this day, in this moment, you walk into a supermarket and you inspect how much inventory of bread is on its shelves and in the warehouse, uh, in the storage space and in the warehouse. And uh, that amount of physical inventory of this product category, if we were to translate it into a dollar amount, obviously there are two ways. You could translate it at the wholesale prices, in other words, the cost to the retailer. You could also translate it at the retail prices to consumer. When it comes to computing Jim Roy, keep in mind that we use inventory at cost. In other words, to convert the amount of physical inventory into a dollar amount, we evaluate the merchandise at the wholesale prices to the retailer. In other words, the wholesale prices that a retailer pays to the supplier to acquire the merchandise. 
Or in the case of self-produced private label products, you look at the production cost of that merchandise. Um, and in practice, obviously, the inventory level of a product category is not uh, perfectly stable during the course of the year. So how do we compute average inventory at a cost um, in practice? You can take inventory throughout the year and then take the average. For example, at the end of each month, check the inventory level of the that product category and evaluate at the cost to the retailer and write down the number. And then at the end of the next month, take the inventory, again, evaluate it at the cost to a retailer. And then we can get 12 numbers throughout the course of the year and take the average. This is how we get the average inventory at a cost. By the way, retailers take inventory on a regular basis. So this is not an extra step. In fact, the average inventory at a cost can be easily computed based on a retailer's regular inventory records. Okay, so now back to the computation of Jim Roy. As I just mentioned, the Jim Roy is usually measured on an annual basis, okay? It can be uh, expressed as a percentage term or just as a number. When it's expressed as a number for most product categories, um, it is in the range of a single digit. For example, uh, 2.5, 3.7, 4.5. Um, it's usually a um, single digit for most um, uh, product categories. So how do we, um, and equivalently, you could express it as a percentage term. Both forms have been used in practice. Okay, so um, for example, if the genroid of a product category is 3.5, so how do we interpret this 3.5 numerically? Uh, 3.5 or 350% means that for every dollar that a retailer invests in the inventory of this product category, the retailer makes three and a half dollars in gross profit in a year. So once again, genroid is the input and output measure so we need to be clear about the input is in terms of investment in the inventory, okay, uh, measured on a dollar basis. And the output is in terms of gross profit. In other words, it's not in terms of net sales. It's not in terms of net profit. It's the term in the middle, the gross margin part of it, okay. Um, so once we understand the basic definition of Jim Roy, let's look at what factors contribute to Jim Roy. Like return on assets, Jim Roy can be decomposed into two parts as illustrated by the second equation on the screen. So Jim Roy can be decomposed into the ratio of gross margin divided by net sales. What is this? This is just the percentage gross margin as we saw a few slides ago, right? And by the second part, which is a ratio of net sales of a product category in the year divided by the average inventory value of the category evaluated at the cost to the retailer. Okay, and this ratio is called sales to stock ratio. In spirit, it captures the same idea as inventory turnover rates, but mathematically, they're not the same. Okay, in a few slides, I'm going to show you exactly how to compute inventory turnover rate. But just keep in mind that the sales to stock ratio in spirit captures the same idea as inventory turnover rate. Okay, it reflects how efficient is a retailer utilizing the cash investment in the inventory of a product category in generating sales. Okay, um, now we can see that Jimroid is contributed by two factors. The first one is the percentage gross margin. And the second one essentially is about the inventory turnover rates. Okay. Um, so that's why Jim Royd is a more comprehensive measure about the merchandising performance of a product category than the percentage gross margin. Even though percentage gross margin might be more often looked at or easier to compute. Okay. Um, 
once again, the reason that gene void is a more insightful, more meaningful measure than percentage growth margin is because it captures two aspects of a retail oper uh, of a retail operation, both of which contributes to the overall profitability. One is essentially um, out of each given transaction, how much money you can make, and in this case, measured in terms of gross profit, gross margin. And the other, just as important aspect is how efficient are you able to utilizing your cap working capital, in other words, cash investment, in investing in the right, um, uh, in the right product at the right level of inventory to generating um, transactions by buying and selling, buying and selling. Okay, that once again is captured by the sales to stock ratio, which essentially um, captures the same spirit as inventory turnover rate. Okay. Um, all right, so any questions about the definition of Jim Roy and why Jim Roy is a more comprehensive measure about the merchandising performance than percentage gross margin? All right, now let's see an example of how to apply Jim Roy. Okay, so suppose you run a general merchandise store and uh, the bakery department is one of your merchandising department and another one is canned food. And suppose um, I gave you uh, data on the net sales, the gross margin and the average inventory at cost of each of the two merchandise department. Obviously as a retail manager, you want to know that uh, um, starting from which of your departments generates higher return in terms of the investment in their revenue. And that would allow you to see what are the potential problem areas and where you should um, cut back on the investment, where you can allocate it to ramp up the investment. That fundamentally depends on what type of products or department can give you more bang for the buck for your investment, right? Um, so just as an exercise, can you compute the gymroid of each of these two merchandise departments? And you can type your answer as, a, I would ask you to type it as a private chat to me. This is what I learned from my uh, classroom teaching. Um, this way, you're not, go you're, um, you're not going to influence other people's answers and you also will not be influenced by other people's answers. Okay, so I'll give you a moment. Um, to work out this exercise together. While we're doing that, can I ask a quick question? Of course, please go ahead. So, so it sounds like, so not just at the category level, but maybe within category, I might be able to do some skew, skew rationalization based on this. Uh, absolutely. Okay. You're right. absolutely right. Yeah. You see that I'm using products uh, here as like a department or you know category as illustration, but you can absolutely do it down to skill level. Yes. All right. Um, okay. So in fact, the computation should be fairly straightforward. For the sake of time, I'm just going to, uh, you know, show everybody uh, the answers here. Okay. Um, by the way, if you would like to get a hold of this um, um, this PowerPoint deck, uh, I'm. I'm more than happy to share it. Just send Nicole a note uh, and uh, we'll be happy to forward it to you. Okay, so here, um, based on information given, in fact, all you need is gross margin uh, information and average inventory at a cost. We can compute um, the gymroid for bakery and canned food. Obviously here, the bakery department has substantially higher return on investment um, it, on the inventory investment in terms of gross margin than uh, canned food. Okay, um, the next uh, decomposed equation would further illustrate, okay, what are the sources for the difference? So even though canned food has much higher gross margin in this example, 50% versus 20%, but the sales to stock ratio, which again captures the inventory uh, turnover rate in spirit, um, has much bigger difference between the two categories, which actually tilted, um, you know, the balance toward bakery. Okay, so this certainly would serve as a starting point to think, hmm, obviously I'm getting more money in terms of gross margin from bakery than canned food, 
um, maybe um, I should look closer closely into what's wrong with canned food and to scale back my investment. Or maybe I'm not stocking up the right uh, product items. Or maybe um, you know I just have too much inventory that I couldn't move. In any case, you can see uh, where this leads to. Um, then I'd like to ask everybody a question. Obviously, there's no single performance measure is perfect. Okay, as I mentioned, Gymroid is the most commonly used merchandising performance measure for individual merchandise departments, categories, brands, or down to stock keeping unit. But it does not capture everything that we would like. Okay, what do you think is missing in the Gymroid measure? that is related to the profitability of individual products or product categories. What might be missing here? Going back to our bread versus wine example. So we know that uh, wine um, stays good forever, sort of speaking, but the bread is a highly perishable product, right? Um, let me see if the chat room here. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, perishability. So, you know, a loaf of bread would not last for longer than a week on the shelf. So obviously a retailer is not able to sell all the bread, um, you know, that it has on the shelf. You need to have a certain buffer, which means you also necessarily would have to incur a certain amount of spoilage waste. Is spoilage waste reflected in Jim Roy? No, it's not. Remember, Gymroid is computed based on gross margin, which only reflects gross profit based on merchandise that has been sold. Those that is not sold does not enter the computation. But spoilage obviously would affect the bottom line, the profitability of a product category, right? So can we do better than Gymroid? Um, yes, we can. Okay. That leads to the next performance measure, which is called a direct product profit. So to understand direct product profit, we need to think about what are the additional variable costs associated with selling a product or product category that directly affects its profitability other than the cost of merchandise sold. Okay, this would typically include shipping, handling, bookkeeping, stocking, replenishing, and in addition, the so-called shrinkage. Um, shrinkage includes spoilage waste and loss of value uh, due to thefts, okay? So those are all additional variable costs that directly affect the profitability of selling a product or product category, but it's not reflected in the gross margin figures. So that's why we can actually do better. So if a retailer is able to invest in the system to keep close track of those additional variable costs, which together it's called a so-called direct product cost, then we could arrive at a more precise measure about the profitability of selling a product or category. And this measure is the so-called direct product profit, DPP. It is gross margin further subtracted by those additional variable costs, once again, Together, it is called the direct product cost. Okay, so once we know how to, uh, how to track the data and the compute the direct product profit, it will be straightforward to see that we can actually compute a profitability, merchandising profitability measure that is better than Jim Roy. That is DPP, direct product profit, return on inventory. And the way to compute it is very straightforward. That's why I didn't even have a separate equation. That is, you replace gross margin in the Gymroid equation by DPP, direct product profit, by further subtract those additional variable costs associated with selling a product or a category. In fact, many industry experts have been advocating the use of direct product um, profit and urging retailers to invest in um, data collection system that would allow accurate tracking and itemization allocation of those additional variable costs. Okay, um, I see there is a chat here. Um, so Sharon, you said seasonal sales brand population reflect profit. 
yes, you're absolutely right, right? Um, so those, um, so again, um, those are uh, different quantities that you want to consider, which would allow you to, by the end of the day, come up at a more precise measure of profit or profitability of a product category. Once again, that measure is direct product profit. Okay. Are there any questions about DPP here? All right. If not, um, let me very quickly uh, talk about how to compute inventory turnover. You probably get um, the gist of the, um, you know, the uh, coverage so far. That is, when evaluating the profitability or the performance of retail business, the inventory or the turnover aspect is really important, yet oftentimes is, um, you know, underlooked. So, um, down to the level of individual products uh, in terms of uh, stockkeeping unit or brands or category or merchandise department and even for the entire store, we can actually quantify this idea of turnover by the measure of inventory turnover rates. Okay, it is computed as the cost of goods sold um, in the time span and usually without otherwise specified on an annual basis divided by the average inventory at a cost of the same level of computation, okay? So if you're computing inventory turnover for an entire store, then you look at the cost of goods sold of the entire store, and you look at the average inventory at cost of the entire store, and then the same applies to other levels of computation, okay? So numerically, inventory turnover rate reflects the number of times the average amount of inventory is sold in a given time period. Once again, without otherwise specified, it's usually on an annual basis. So for example, the inventory turnover rate for a typical supermarket is about 15 times a year, okay? Uh, it's, 15, uh, it's about 15. What it means is if you walk into a supermarket, you see the entire inventory of the store Inventory turnover rate equals 15 means that amount of inventory will sell uh, out 15 times in the course of a year um, from this store, okay? Um, so inventory turnover rate is a very useful diagnostic measure. As you can see that, uh, um, you know, we keep on emphasizing the importance of looking at the turnover rate of a retail operation. Um, but keep in mind that inventory turnover rate shouldn't be used as the ultimate performance measure. Rather, it is a diagnostic measure. Okay, think about it. Is it um, so? It looks like we all want high inventory turnover rate. Okay, um, but is it true that the higher the better? It is not. Okay. In other words, you don't want to artificially, um, you know boost up your inventory turnover because there are ways to increase the numerical value of inventory turnover rate, yet you're doing it um, at the cost of the retailer's bottom line. So to say that, that fundamentally is related to the inventory management part of it. Okay, so if we look at the equation of how to compute inventory turnover, okay, what happens if I cut the inventory to half? Okay, assuming everything else is exactly the same. I'm selling exactly the same product at exactly the same price and assume that the consumer demand for that product is exactly the same. Then the net sales of the product will be the same. The cost of goods sold obviously uh, in the year will also be the same. But if I cut the inventory to half, I'm going to double the inventory turnover rates. Okay, but is that a good thing? In general, no. Okay, assuming previously the, um, the category was well performing, the inventory level was right. If you cut the inventory to half, what it means is you need to replenish twice as frequently. And quite likely your truck will have to run half load instead of full load. So in any case, if you're understocked, that will significantly increase your uh, inventory management cost. And that certainly can hurt a retailer's bottom line. Okay, so once again, inventory turnover rate is a very useful diagnostic measure, but it shouldn't be used as the ultimate performance measure. 
um, just very quickly, uh, using the previous example of bakery and canned food, we can compute the inventory turnover rate of both merchandise departments. And for that, based on the information given, we need to uh, compute additional piece that's directly needed, that is the cost of goods. And uh, um, assuming that there's no additional uh, source of revenue in the two product categories, such as uh, promotional allowances or uh, those things, then the cost of goods sold in general is just the difference between net sales and gross margin, okay? And then divide that by the average inventory at the cost. Now we see that the two merchandise departments in the example actually vary, uh, differs, uh, differ drastically in the inventory turnover rates. For bakery, it's 32, 32 times a year. For canned food, it's five times a year. And this certainly should raise a red flag. You know something is definitely not doing right in your canned food department. Think about it. Inventory turnover rate being five times a year means on average, the inventory will be sitting on your shelf or staying in your store for almost three months. So um, it's not just a matter of having too much inventory. Maybe you're just not sourcing the right products. Maybe people just don't you know, like them at all. So this is actually a sign that more drastic measures might need to be taken um, in addition to just cutting down the inventory itself. Okay, um, any, sorry. Any questions here? All right, if not, let me just very briefly mention that, um, so, so far what we have talked about is primarily about um, profitability or return on investment in terms of either total assets or um, um, uh, working capital, in other words, cash. And for retailers operating in physical spaces, there's another very precious source of resource, uh, type of resources that is the physical space. And because of that, um, there are also um, a variety of space productivity measures. And I'm going to illustrate just one of them. You'll see that once you see how it works with one, the other is really analogous. Okay, so a commonly used space productivity measure is sales per square footage. So it's the annual sales, or you can also modify it to quarterly sales or monthly sales revenue per square footage of the store space. And when, when computing sales per square footage, by convention, it is the space of, um, it's the selling space in the store that is used instead of the growth space because retail stores vary widely in terms of whether they have and the size of waiting uh, space, sitting areas, bathroom, fitting room, elevators, and so on and so forth, which do not directly generate sales. Okay, so those areas should be uh, taken out of the picture to make the comparison on a more equal footing. Um, for retailers that sell products, um, that are displaced on shelves with equal width, for example, supermarket retailers, drugstore retailers, mass merchandisers, they also often use sales per linear footage as a way for space productivity, okay? And uh, obviously we could replace sales by other performance figures such as gross profit, or better yet, if you have the data uh, to compute the direct product to profit, then DPP per square footage or linear footage would be even more meaningful to reflect the space productivity. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, I, I'd like to um, move on to the next uh, uh, section. That is, I want to introduce to everybody a fairly simple and easy to implement um, analytical tool called a fair share analysis. And to illustrate how to apply fair share analysis to make assortment size decisions and shelf space allocation decisions. Okay. Um, by the way, has anybody heard about fair share analysis in any context? Um, you could just uh, make a gesture on the screen, raising your hand or raising your hand virtually in Zoom. All right, um, it's okay. You'll see that the name may sound a little uh, intimidating, but that the idea is fairly straightforward, okay? 
Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about assortment decision um, to uh, set up the, the problem here. Um, as many of you may know that there has been a steady increase in the number of skills in most retail stores. Um, in fact, this trend has been going on for decades, the so-called SKU explosion. Um, retail stores are getting bigger and more cluttered and shelf space is getting more cluttered. On the other hand, retailers have been urged to adopt the so-called efficient assortment policy to take a closer look into the efficiency, uh, the productivity of their assortment to lower the operating costs by eliminating low selling items. And also from a consumer demand perspective, uh, consumers in general demand a certain level of variety and a choice, but it's not always the more the better. Um, there have been empirical research uh, showing that um, store visit frequency and the total sales can actually increase if a retailer um, engage in moderate reduction in their assortment and make their stores less cluttered and uh, um, in, to make it easier for consumers to make their purchase decisions. Okay, and uh, so obviously assortment decision is a combination of art and the science. So what I'm going to introduce you is a quantitative measure to at least to get you started with assessing the productivity of the assortment size and think about whether there's room for improvement. Okay, as we know that the COVID pandemic really has caused major disruptions in supply chain. Um, and because of that, a lot of retailers are actually being uh, pushed and forced to re-examine their assortment and to streamline their assortment to focus on the high demand items to further enhance efficiency. Um, so in my view, this is actually a good nudge that uh, should persist after the pandemic. Okay, um, many analytical tools have been developed for assisting retail assortment decisions. And most of them in fact are developed to deal with uh, category level decisions. And one of such tools, which as I said, is a really easy, uh, it's a tool that's really easy to implement. It's um, the so-called fair share analysis. Okay, so fair share analysis can be performed in a very comprehensive way at the entire store or assortment level to allow retailers to have a quick assessment of the individual merchandise department or categories uh, performance relative to either the store average or if you choose to just focus on your merchandising department then compared to the um, uh, department average. So um, this would allow you to identify underperforming categories or subcategories or individual brands or even stock keeping units, okay. And uh, so fair share analysis is carried out by computing and comparing a variety of the so-called fair share indices. And each fair share index compares essentially the resources that a category takes relative to the contribution it makes. Okay, it will become more clear in the next slide when I show you exactly how to compute fair share indices. Um, in fact, let's um, now apply fair share uh, indices to the uh, assortment size decision. The most common measure about assortment size is the number of skills. In other words, the number of individual items that a retailer sells, okay? The assortment size can be measured at the overall store level. Um, it can be measured at the merchandise department level or for individual product categories, okay? So here I'm going to use category as unit of analysis. Um, we can compute um, um, a set of related fair share indices with regard to the number of skills of the category. And those different indices are computed based on different output measures. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Fair share index of number of skills on sales Okay, so here the focal decision variable is number of skills of a category. Okay, and we're comparing a category's number of skills 
to its fair share of contribution in terms of sales output. Okay, so it's computed as the category's share of the store level total number of skills. So essentially, it's you look at how many skills are there in this category, how many skills are at the store level, and then you take the ratio to get the category's share of total number of skills, and then divided by the category's contribution to the total dollar sales at the store level. In other words, we look at the category's sales. Um, you can look at a monthly basis, quarterly basis, or on an annual basis. And then you look at what um, is the percentage as to the total dollar sales at the store level and take the ratio here, okay? And then we could also compute other fair share indices using different output measures. For example, by replacing sales by the gross profit of a category, or better yet, to replace um, sales or, or gross profit by direct product profit, DPP, which gets closer. In fact, it's the most accurate measure of the true profitability of a category. Okay. And then, so in each of the case, as you can see that a fair share index compares to the categories, the resource that it takes by a category in term, in this case is in terms of share of the total skills compared to its relative contribution it makes to the store level, okay? And a, a, a fair share index as defined above, so keep in mind what goes to the numerator, what goes to the denominator. Logically, there's nothing wrong if you flip the numerator and the denominator. Obviously, the numerical value will change and the interpretation will change as well. That's why I emphasize as defined above, okay? If you look at other references, you may see the numerator and the denominator flips, but the usage um, in the insight that we can draw from them um, are exactly the same. So fair share indices as defined here, if the value is less than one, it means the category performs better on a per skill basis than the store average. And if the value is greater than one, it's the opposite. Okay, so let's look at a stylized example here. So um, in this example, there are 50 skills in the category and there are a thousand skills at the store level. So the category's share of number of skills is 5%, right? That's 50 divided by a thousand is 5%. And then let's assume that the category's annual net sales is 100K and at the store level, it's 1000K. So the category's share to the total net sales of the store is 10%, okay? And here, let's assume that the category's gross profit here, 24K, uh, which is 8% of the total gross profit at the store level, 300K. All right. So those would allow us to compute fair share index of number of skills on net sales and gross profit. So if I were, uh, if we just focus on the first one, fair share index of number of skills on net sales. So it's the category's share of skills, 5% divided by 10%, that's 0 0.5. So intuitively, can you see that the category performs better than the store average in terms of generating sales on a per store basis. I'll give you a moment to just uh, digest this. <coughs> so is it clear to everybody why fair share index um, computed in such way when its value is less than one, it indicates that um, the category's performance on a per skill basis is better than the store average. So intuitively here, the category takes 5% of the total number of skills of the store, but it contributed to 10% of its total net sales. So obviously on the per uh, skill basis, it generates more sales than the store average, right? The same can be said about its contribution to the gross profit. So here is an example where the category certainly is doing very well. Okay, 
And one thing I do want to um, you know, emphasize, uh, which is easier to do once we have seen the computation of fair share indices is that they are meant to be used as diagnostic tools. They are not supposed to be used at, to set the ultimate performance objectives. Okay, so by definition, some categories will have fair share indices less than one and some will have fair share indices greater than one, right? Because they are being compared to the average. So this is not like well begun where every child is above average. Okay, so fair share indices should serve as a starting point for you to have a comprehensive view about the relative performance, again, across merchandise departments or maybe categories or brands or individual skills. And that should be a starting point for you to say, okay, let me look at the categories, for example, that have fair share indices greater than one. Then first of all, how much is the discrepancy? And is the discrepancy a sensible one, a meaningful one, or it's indication that something is not right with this category? Okay, and then you start from there and to think about, should you cut the number of skills of those categories uh, or merchandise department? Okay, um, any questions here? All right. So once we understand how to compute and use fair share indices for assortment size decisions, you can see that the same logic can be applied to variety of other decisions, including shelf space allocation decisions. In other words, how much space should you give to a merchandise department and more um, down the line, how much to each individual categories, how much to a brand, and even how much to uh, each specific stockkeeping unit, okay? And the way to compute those fair share indices are very similar to the previous set, with exception that we now replace the numerator by other measures. So here, once again, a fair share index compares uh, the resources that a category takes relative to the contribution it makes. So here the resources a category takes is in terms of the shelf space it's being allocated to, okay? So we're going to replace the numerator by the category's share of total square footage of space or linear footage of space, however a retailer actually measures the space allocated to different products, okay? And once again, Fair share indices defined in such a way should be used as diagnostic tools. And the interpretation is that one, if a fair share index is less than one, the category performs better than the store average. And here is in terms of on the per unit space basis. Okay. And if it's value, if its value is greater than one, then it's the opposite. And they should, they should serve as a starting point for you to uh, look at and think about, well, are we giving too much space to this department or category or brand, or there's not enough space uh, because uh, this category apparently has so much more potential. Um, and again, you can see how to apply such insights to improve your merchandising decisions. All right. Um, are there any questions about fair share analysis that we have talked about? I know we have covered a lot of information in a pretty uh, condensed time period. All right, if not, let me use the remaining seven or eight minutes to very quickly talk about utilizing statistical models to enhance retail decision makings. So most of today's webinar has focused on basic uh, descriptive and the diagnostic analysis using data that are commonly available to most retailers, including the basic sales and inventory management records. Okay, um, but there have been um, a large number and a variety of more sophisticated and more advanced data analytical tools developed and applied to address 
all aspects of retail business and retail decisions, in fact, for a pretty long time. So I do want to very briefly talk about, you know, the power that uh, statistical models as one such type of advanced data analytical tools can be used to uh, enhance retail decisions. In fact, the phrase rocket science retailing has been used. The retail industry is one of the most data rich industry, and it also creates uh, such a rich, uh, you know, ground uh, for us to um, apply all kinds of advanced data analytics techniques to draw insights and to um, improve decision making. And given the very limited time that we have today, I just want to very briefly talk about um, two broad types of statistical models. One such type is so-called sales response models. So the basic idea is to quantify the relationship between sales quantity and a variety of merchandising decision variables, as well as other factors that may influence the sales quantity of a product. Okay. Um, and uh, such models are calibrated using either store level or market level sales and merchandising activity data of a given focal product. And the product can be at a skill level, can be at a brand size combination level, or can be a given brand of a given in a given product category. Um, there are a variety of specific forms of model that can be used to uh, build and um, estimate sales response models, including linear regression models or nonlinear models such as log-log models or semi-log models. In general, nonlinear models work better in capturing the relationships between sales quantity and a variety of other variables, including marketing decision variables, merchandising decision variables, than linear regression models. Okay, so why do we bother to you know estimate the, those seemingly pretty complex models? Well, we can um, you know uh, we can draw a variety of really useful insights from this kind of models. So, for example, we can use uh, the model estimation results to quantify price sensitivity, for example, in the form of price elasticity. We can more accurately assess promotional lifts by controlling for the compounding effect of other factors, other variables that may affect the sales quantitative product in addition to promotion or changes in promotional status. We can also use such models to perform sales forecasts in the variety of what if analysis. What if you change the scenarios of pricing promotion or shelf space allocation or increasing, decreasing your um, you know, advertising or drop a social media advertising? What's going to happen to the sales? Okay, so those models can be very useful for uh, sales forecasting. And um, under certain conditions, they can also be used to perform price optimization for individual products, okay? Um, so this is one type of really useful uh, source of data and the models. And th there are also many models that can be built and utilized based on um, individual purchase history data so that uh, we can draw a variety of insights about individual consumers' purchase decisions. Um, the, most, the two most common sources of individual level purchase history data widely available in this country is the household scanner panel data, which can be acquired by AC, uh, from AC Nielsen and Information Resources Inc. Those are the two largest marketing research companies uh, in this country. Both of them have worked long time with a large number of retail chains to form their own uh, data syndicates and also maintain a large number of household panels uh, around the country. And the panel participants purchase history data, the so-called panel data part, are combined with store audit data so that we can link individuals' purchase behaviors with a variety of marketing decision variables, merchandising decision variables, and other relevant factors. Okay, another common source um, of data that can be utilized is a retailer's own loyalty program database, which are also often called the preferred shopper card data. Okay, such data have, uh, have very similar structure to the standard scanner panel data but it 
and it has very high coverage of a retailer's own customer base. But of course, the downside is it has no coverage of other stores or other channels. Um, so uh, there are a variety of models that have been built and used in retail practice, utilizing individual level purchase history data. For example, uh, store choice models, store visit frequency or incidence models, shopping trip spending models, category level purchase incident models or frequency models, brand choice models, uh, a brand or skill level spending models. Okay, so those models can provide a really a very rich set of insights to assist the retail decision making. For example, it would allow us to have a very uh, detailed understanding about consumers uh, channel choice behaviors and the channel switching behaviors. And in addition, what are the factors that may driving such behavior or behavior change? Similarly, uh, we could use those models to study store choice and store switching behaviors and their drivers. And then brand choice behavior, brand switching behavior, and what drives consumers brand choice and brand switching decisions. What may lead to, for example, purchase acceleration and the stockpiling behavior in what product categories and driven by what factors, okay? And such models can also provide insights because they're done calibrated at individual level. It can also be used to design customized promotion um, activities or offerings, um, including incorporating it as a part of retailers integrated loyalty program initiatives. And in a broader context, they can offer really rich insights to assist a retailer's customer relationship management. So not just increasing sales and transaction um, in the short term, but really how to build customer loyalty in the long term. Um, so with that, uh, I know we're running out of time. So I just want to wish everybody much success in utilizing data analytics to um, all in all aspects of your work uh, or your future careers. Um, and if you have any questions about any of the topics, any of the metrics that have been covered in today's webinar, feel free to shoot me an email or contact Nicole who will forward your request to me. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, so Nicole, I will um, transfer it back to you to maybe um, announce the upcoming uh, webinars to our audience. Yes, um, thank you so much, G, for walking us through all these different indexes and examples of statistical models. I know you had a little bit of like a time crunch there, but I think certainly a lot of our retailer audiences would have learned so much about how to use these different indexes to assess their performance and really think about how to improve their businesses and sales. And before I let everybody go, I want to quickly let you know of our upcoming webinars. So we have a very exciting webinar planned for next week, actually. So next Wednesday, we'll have a panel discussion with five different restaurateurs in this area. So they're owners of restaurants and bars that I'm sure you have been to um, in this DMV area. So Tim Carmen from the Washington Post and Maryland professor Judy Frells would lead this really interesting discussion to learn how these restaurateurs have dealt with COVID. And then the following week, we also have Ji's third webinar. So in her three-part retail series, this will be her last webinar. Um, and in this third webinar, Ji will also have three guest panels and discuss really important questions ranging from things like how to successfully move a retail business online and how consumer spending has changed during the time of COVID, et cetera. And so we, we really hope to see you guys there in our next two webinars. So thank you again for joining us for Jay's second webinar today. And we'll end our webinar here. So take care, everybody. And thank you so much again for joining.